thanks Tony for your generous introduction and again thank you Bob and for everybody that made this conference possible. I can't tell you how excited I was to be here last night and to see the level of support and interest in the things that we're talking about in terms of how the mind works. Now those of you who are local are not used to seeing me speaking on stage, so I hope that you'll be generous in your evaluation. <laughs> in the 40 years that I've been a professional cellist, I've thought a great deal about what constitutes the unique characteristics of each individual performer. I noticed that some played the instrument naturally well, others seemed to have a lot to say musically, and others just had a special charisma on stage. I also noticed that there were many successful players who had at least two of these qualities in the ascendant. I started to use these three dynamic states as a way of evaluating players, either professionals, entrants in competitions, or auditioning prospective students. I started thinking about them as archetypes and to think about how one might train a player most effectively in these three disciplines, obviously culminating the training with a synthesis of the three working to, in harmony together. I call these archetypes musician, athlete, and performer. In the last 20 years, I've been intrigued by what we have learned through sports medicine and the work on music and the brain. I've been especially excited about how the mental work has helped me. Uh, I have a problem here with this computer. <laughs> you need to restart your computer, hold down the button until it turns off, and then press the power button. You don't have to get out of this. So, um, so in the last 20 years I've been intrigued about what we've learned through sports medicine and the work on music and the brain and especially excited about the mental work that has helped me and my students. So, while we're trying to figure, should we just do this? I think we better do Just hold, hold, hold. So what we're going to do is play for you. Thank you. 
so let's take a look at these three archetypes and the musician, athlete, and performer as these three different states. Now, the musician, that part of this, this archetype, is a completely mental issue. There's no work at the instrument. The athlete is a combination of mental and physical, but mostly physical, and the performer is a combination of mental and physical, but mostly mental. This order is significant, and we will define them and look at the mental procedures and exercises for each. Now, to reinforce this idea, there's a, perhaps a business analog that would make this even easier to understand. Musician, research and development, the athlete, production, and the performer, marketing and sales. So this is bringing a product to market. You can't actually produce anything unless you have a plan. And you can't, and once, once the uh, item is there, then you can actually sell it. Now, if we believe the contemporary reports of his playing, we'd have, to, we'd have to say that Franz Liszt was the greatest pianist that ever lived. And he said, others think once and play 10 times, I think 10 times and play once. I think that's pretty good. All right, so let's define the musician. The goal of the musician, to achieve an understanding of why things are the way they are in the text, to ask questions of the score, to endeavor to understand to the best of our abilities the composer's intention and inspiration. And the chief attributes for this are free creativity, curiosity, mirroring the creation of the text. This first archetype is terribly important because it is here that we lay the foundation for all the work that we do for performance. So what about the mental procedures for the musician? Number one, score study, or getting to know you. Number two, part preparation, for those of us who play in ensemble music, may I have this dance, and making a strategic plan. Where's my GPS? <laughs> now, score study doesn't need to be a formal process but just starting with things that one sees first in the text. It's a little like speed dating. Let's take three examples and try to find these first things that I see in these scores if this were, as if this were a speed date. Hey, lyric suite, you look cute. So <laughs> tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, shy, are you? <laughs> okay, well, don't, you don't have to say anything. I can tell a lot just by looking at you. Okay, you're fast, but not that fast. <clears throat> um, and that, that everything you're going to do in this, mu in this movement is going to be jovial and, and happy. Looks like there's a lot of three-on-one in this. So we have, you know, the lower three voices speaking first and then the first violin. So there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of this stuff. Oh, also, the music goes up and down. It's pretty easy, the first chords, ba da boo wo And then first violin, ba da ba da ba da ba bee ba da do ba bo 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 And that kind of idea goes back and forth. Oh, look, and then in the third system, we have lots of imitation as people are trying to show off at different times. First violin, ba da ba da ba da ba da bee viola, ba da ba da ba da ba da bee Second violin, ba da ba da ba da ba da bee And the first violin again, ba da ba da ba da ba bee Ah, a bell, time for the next date. Ah. Beethoven, F major cello sonata at the Allegro. What's the first thing that we can see with you? Well, it's dolce, it's piano. I see lots of horizontal pulsation and harmony. This is very nice, and you see the cello breaks off there. That's very nice, very affirming. Uh, the melody goes up and down, just like the Berg did. We see sort of triads, triadic music, and we see stepwise music or scale-like music. So the beginning of this lift with the triad, blah, dee, da, dee, da, coming down by scale. And the third bar going up by triad, ba, ba, da, 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 scales, da, da, da. And the other one, blah, and the last bar of that system comes down. Second system, what do we see? In the melody, we see extended second beats. Pa, dee, bum, bum, ba, da, 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 bum, da, 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 and then, just like the Baird, look at that third system. You know, that's very exciting and ecstatic. Wow, that's great. Oh, bell rings, next piece. Oh, the bourrées from the Bach that we're our old friends. What are the first things that we see here? Well, 
first beret, second beret, they're some kind of, they're talking to each other, just like a minuet trio, a scherzo trio, or two minuets. So what do we see? Well, the first thing that we see, the first beret's in C major, second beret's in C minor. That's pretty important. The first, triadic and articulated, and the second one, smooth. It's also stepwise motion again. And that there are some chords in the first one, but none in the second. Okay, so let's take a look now at other kinds of things with, with score study. Musical structure. Now, when I'm, when I'm trying to work with musical structure, I use this as a basic outline for all the work that I'm going to be doing, and it gives us a way to look at the basic structure of the work, decide where things begin and end, and make observations about that. Then I use each section as a way to do more detailed work with these observations. What is surprising or unique in each section? And then I let the musical structure be the outline for study and performance. Now I have an undergrad who's just finished uh, the semester recently and she's on her way to a summer festival, but she had a little time in between and she went to Washington, D.C. to do a two-week internship in something, but she couldn't take her cello. So she called me and she said, what am I going to do about practicing? And I said, well, this is a perfect time for you to learn the fourth suite prelude of Bach and memorize it. She said, great idea. So she worked all day and then she practiced for an hour or two in the evenings without her cello. When she got back to Florida, she called me and said, ecstatically said, this is so easy now at the cello. I really know exactly what I'm going to do. All right, let's go on for the musical structure and take a look at, at the... Um, at a possible timeline. This is another thing that I do when I'm looking at a piece. Again, this does not necessarily have to be strictly along the kinds of things that we learn in music theory. Not that that's bad, Tony. We love that. But, <laughs> but just, again, we're looking at, at first reactions. This, this kind of method is a little bit like Chinese box diagrams, boxes within boxes, and sort of allows you to get more and more detailed. So this is the exposition of the Beethoven Sonata in A major. You can almost see almost see the entire exposition. It sort of didn't quite make it off. There are 91 bars in, the, in, the, in that exposition. That's the first of four large sections. And then you see within this exposition there are three sections. And then in each of those there are two or three sections. Then in each of those there are sort of many, many more. So in this first theme section I sort of decided that I wanted it to be lyrical and boisterous as the two basic characters. And you see in the closing theme that that comes back again. And then the second theme is just the piano leads and the cello complements, and then the cello leads and the piano complements. Now, that, those are things that I'm just making notes to myself that will help me to know where I am in the score as a performer. Um, it, this is all hierarchical, of course, and so that's, that's a good way to... The idea is to get it out on the page and then have a response to the text. Now, the notion about preparing a part is important. This is also part of the score study for those of us that play ensemble music because uh, since we are only part of a large whole, and we saw a couple of scores, if I'm playing that Beethoven cello sonata, I will only have the notes for the cello, I won't have the notes for the piano. And so I need to know what else is going on, or a string quartet similarly. So with both the part and the score laying open, I'm writing rhythmic cues into the part to draw attention to what one needs to hear. Uh, secondly, I look for opportunities of personalizing a moment. So if there's something special I see in the score that the cello is going to do, a cadenza, or everybody stops playing and I'm playing something, I want to be able to give it a little extra time, a little extra thought to make something unique and important happen at that place. I note at this point when I'm going through the part, the things that are going to be complex are going to need a little bit of special attention, technical issues and that kind of stuff, and I even start writing in all my boings and fingerings before I've even gotten through the, gotten to the cello yet. And finally, a quick note about being part of the digital age and observing recordings, CDs, DVDs, and YouTube. Number one, I note that the experiencing other performance is dramatically important after one is already invested in the text and making one's own observations. So you already have made it your own. And then, the kind, then two, the reactions that you can get can be both positive and negative, which tend to reinforce your point of view which is, of course, the most important. Now, when I've done all this stuff, I'm, I'm ready to work at the cello, and this is the main point. The musician prepares completely so that the hearing the score inside when preparing the part physically is the most efficient way to fully prepare. 
And I want to tell two stories about how this works at different levels of experience. The first story is about the Kolisch String Quartet, a famous Viennese group uh, that played every concert by heart without music, without music stands, anything. They played everything. They made a deal with Schoenberg, who was their mentor. They said, if we really know the music that well, we should be able to play it by heart. And so they were uh, traveling from the East Coast to Berkeley, California to play a series of concerts there. And as was their uh, routine, they were, this is right after the Second World War, they stopped at Chicago to change trains, sent a cable ahead to the sponsor, said we will be on such and such a train. The sponsor wrote back and said, great, we'll be there, just confirming your program. And the program, the very first piece that they were supposed to play was the Haydn Emperor String Quartet. Now Haydn String Quartet shouldn't be any particular problem, but number one, they had not played it. And number two, um, the slow movement was a beautiful set of variations that Haydn wrote on the Emperor's Hymn, which was unfortunately co-opted by Hitler into Deutschland, Deutschland über alles. And so these four uh, Jewish Viennese musicians looked at each other and said, can we play this now? The war is over, can we do this now? And they decided that they could. So instead of writing back and complaining about the miscommunication and the cable, they went ahead and walked over to the music store, bought a single miniature score of the Haydn Quartet, and while they were on the train traveling to Berkeley, they passed it around to each member. They studied the score and were ready to do that. So they figured, well, we'll have plenty of time to go over it uh, before the concert. Well, you know, the train got stalled in the mountains and that kind of stuff. And by the time that they got to the Berkeley train station, the audience were already in their seats waiting for the quartet to show. So the sponsor picked them up, got them to the hall, and the first time that they actually played it was in concert. The second story is about um, a music teacher uh, in Tennessee. I gave a talk similar to this uh, a couple years ago, and this music teacher come up, came up to me afterwards, and she said, I'm so interested in what you had to say, certainly based on my experience. She had been asked to take over two music programs at two schools in the same town, and when she showed up, one group had instruments and the other didn't. Uh, they were a little short on their budget, uh, but they would come later. And so she decided, look, I've got my lesson plans all figured out. I'm just going to teach the kids as if they had the instruments. And so she went ahead and taught them both exactly the same lesson plans. And so by the time that the instruments showed up a couple months later, the ones that did not have instruments obviously were very hungry. And, uh, and they excelled in very short amount of time. They were far surpassing the students that had had the instruments. So then I say, are you ready to play? <laughs> and, um, and then I note just one more thing about the musician. Nathan Milstein, the famous violinist, asked Leopold Auer, his teacher, am I practicing enough? And Leopold Auer said, practice with your fingers and you need all day. Practice with your mind and you will do as much in an hour and a half. And that has certainly been my personal experience. All right, let's talk about the athlete. The goal of the athlete is to achieve unconscious fluency as in walking or talking, to create an intelligent interface between how the body efficiently works and how the bow and instrument optimally work. Now, when I'm teaching my students about this, uh, we keep trying to focus on the village idiot, you know, as if this was so, you were feeling almost so stupid that it becomes self-evident how the body actually works. The, goal, the chief attributes for the athlete are simplicity and efficiency. And, uh, and then the mental procedures. These are the first three of, of several. Making strong links to things that we all do unselfconsciously, using technical rhythm to predict the future movement, and taking a complex task and separate them into solvable parts. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about <coughs> making analogies with things that we do naturally. We, we're binary people, we walk, and we, and we talk, but walking is just one leg in front of the other, and bowing is just one bow after the other. And so one starts to actually make, make allusions to what we would do if we were walking, and the bow went back as simple as possible.
So running or whatever we want to do, it should be as simple as possible. When the dynamics, the dynamic, the way the body works dynamically, it should be fine. With the left hand, it's similar. I try to make all this stuff as simple as possible for the athlete. There are only three things that we do with the left hand. Put fingers down, change positions, or shifting, and vibrating. And this motion of the arm can do all three things. And if you learn these things together, it's more easily to coordinate that. So if I'm doing... Is something that I use the flow chart for. Now here's a flow chart for intonation. With any of these flow charts, the most important thing that one has to understand is the very first question. Because many times the first question is, is, is itself already the answer. For intonation, the question is, do you know what it sounds like when it's in tune? It's almost too obvious to be able to ask that question, but many times that is where the problems are. And as you see by looking at the chart, it goes yes and no. You move, work your way through the chart as a way of getting quickly to the issues at hand. And this is especially for cellist or string players, of course, dealing with positions and playing and so on. All right, now there are just a couple more here. Uh, number four, a lighthearted attitude in working on complex issues. When I'm teaching virtuoso music to my students. We're talking a lot about these are the things that seem especially difficult and complex. But I have them put a little sign on the music stand and say, it's no problem. And actually, when you start thinking about it's not being a problem, you start looking for ways to make it simple. And it starts to feel like a puzzle that, where you're looking for solutions to that. And then, of course, finally, the same thing as in the musician, making a strategic plan so you understand where you are. It's like your personal GPS. Now, as a coda to the athlete, I'd like to talk a little bit about, since this is a physical thing, making sure that you have good conditioning routines away from the instrument that would support and reinforce the central physical issues, healthy physical issues. So things like martial arts or yoga, and my, my favorite is body blade. Body blade is a, is a uh, this is it. It's an exercise tool. It has, it has weights on the other hand, a handle in the center, and the way in which you work it, it works at one speed, which is 270 contractions a minute. And what this does is that the 
large muscles start powering this when you start letting them do that. Large muscles work in harmony with the small muscles. And so that each with these 270 contractions a minute, you're sending neuromuscular pathways that you're reinforcing from the large muscles to the small muscles. And I've been doing exercising with, with this. I usually do a half hour routine with it with all the different muscle groups of the upper body. And it feels self-evident when I sit down at the cello that those, I have those linkages between the large and small uh, muscle groups. It's, so I'm just a little pitch for something that I do. Okay. So with the musician, we have internalized the complex relationships of the score. And with the athlete, we've created the most efficient way to channel this energy through the body and the cello into sound. So the performer da -da, takes the synthesis and creates an event. When it all works smoothly, it's wonderful. I'm going to tell a quick story about a student, former student of mine. Her name is Sarah. She, was, she studied at another school of music before she came here. Uh, she had a really difficult time. She's one of these people that's extremely artistic and gifted. And just before her junior and senior recitals, she had to postpone them because she had all these physical problems that came from uh, stress of working and, and wanting to play with intensity and winding up playing mostly with tension. So when she came here, we decided that we were going to get rid of this. And we spent one year getting her body in alignment and doing all sorts of healthy exercises. And the next year, she did her first master's recital. It was a great success. The second year, she was getting ready for the second master's recital. And she had done a practice performance three weeks before, which we call a preview here at the Shepherd School. And then every, all these old feelings started coming back. Her arms started hurting, and she broke down and was crying and said, I'll never get rid of this. I thought I was over this, and I will never get rid of it. So we made a deal, and I said, I want you to practice as much as you possibly can, but limit yourself to one hour a day on the cello. And she said, OK, that's fine. I can do that. So. I put this picture up there because I used to see her out leaning up against the trees, just sitting there and meditating and practicing, going through her music, practicing the performance, going through it slowly, practicing it quickly. Then she'd do this sometimes in the library or sometimes whenever she could find a small place. At the end of the day, she'd sit down for one hour and go through the things that she had done that day in terms of her mental practicing. She might have practiced as much as six hours a day. The final recital was something that I just couldn't have believed it was so thrilling. She played everything completely by heart, and there wasn't a moment that wasn't completely charged, committed energy, gorgeous artistic playing. OK, let's take a look at the performer. The goal of the performer is to release or channel an ecstatic and magical rendering of the score with a heightened awareness of the work's best features. Obviously, the performer has been tipped off by the musician. The chief attributes are enthusiasm, deep concentration on a childlike, playful environment, and non-judgmental. What are the mental procedures for the, per, per, for the performer? Activating one's imagination, engaging the personality. Now, there are lots of people that have done great work with perf performers, and I particularly love some of the work that's been done with actors, because they take language which they use every day and try to make it into a heightened sense of awareness. They can almost pass through the physical process. Certainly Konstantin Stanislavski, the legendary head of the Moscow Art Theater and creator of method acting, wrote his book, The Actor Prepares. And this is a great place to start in terms of just looking at how uh, you make something live. But this notion of motivation that that he uses in method acting is terribly important. I use that a lot. What would be your motivation for playing that cello line in the, in the F major sonata, for example? What, how do you create character? What's your motivation for coming in after you've, re after you've been resting? Now, when I teach string quartets, I often ask questions based on enthusiasm as they're getting ready for performance. One of the exercises that I do is that I will ask each person to find their favorite place in the movement and put a star next to it. And then we'll go around the room and sort of say, where did you put your star? And they'll, they'll tell us where it is. And then we say, why do you love this so much? And they'll try to describe what it is in the music that really makes it so fantastic for them. 
And then, as a group, we start brainstorming about how to make this moment even, even better, even celebrating those attributes that get you so excited. And then, in terms of making this make sense and speak, we look at the music that precedes it and the music that follows it. All right, and now, mental procedures for the performer, we have activating one's imagination. Now, learning deep concentration and focusing on the moment, this is a big problem for performers who get very distracted while they're playing. So I call it tunnel thinking with enthusiasm, that you sort of staying in the moment and staying where you're going, you know where you're going to, where you're heading with that. And lots of times I like to use rhythm and pulse in rhythm at musical time as a way of maintaining connection with the score. And then finally, slaying the dragon putting the psychological adversaries where they belong. Now, Don Green is a great uh, coach for performers, and he first made a splash with uh, Greg Louganis and the American Diving Team. <clears throat> All right, so many of you know this story. He, he uh, coached the American Diving Team to a bunch of gold medals in the Olympics, and his method for that was to get them to, in quiet meditation, Visualize their walking out of the locker room, climbing the steps to the diving platform, however many steps they took to, until they got into position, exactly everything they would, they would spring, uh, spring on the dive, do the perfect turns or whatever they're going to do, enter the water perfectly, go down, come up, look at the scoreboard, see the perfect 10 for the judges, swim out, dry off, go back to the locker room and they would repeat this visualization process till it was getting deeply rooted in their experience. And so that, that's exactly what they did. And then my daughter, Becca, who is a violinist with the Chiara String Quartet, did a course with uh, Don Green at Juilliard. And he had everybody do lots of different performance projects, but she was getting ready for her Juilliard jury, which is always very tough, and she was particularly concerned about her unaccompanied Bach. So Don's idea was to have a practice partner, and so you would actually perform, and the practice partner was taking notes about your performance, but then also occasionally distracting you. So my daughter told me about this wonderful time she was playing this beautiful Bach, and her boyfriend was taking balled up socks and throwing it at her <laughs> occasionally, and sort of hit her in the head, and then of course she's supposed to stay in concentration and practice that thing. And then he'd slip over to the stereo and turn on an Elliot Carter string quartet, which could be as distracting if you're playing Bach. So, one needs to practice the performing process, the channeling of the synthesis of musician, athlete, and performer into one single impulse. Being aware of the balance between improvisation and control, which is always a, an issue that we have, and making this final strategic plan so you have enough experience doing all of that. Our ultimate goal is to get lost. Get lost in the score. Get lost in the artistic moment so that we can all feel that we are one. I want to conclude with telling one final story about a friend of mine who's a pianist who regularly plays with a violinist as a duo, and they played concerts in great halls all over the world, but their most important concert experience was for a senior center in North Dakota. They began each recital with a performance of the Copeland Violin Sonata, a work that was dedicated to a young friend of Copeland's whose plane was shot down during combat in the Second World War. The performers would always verbally introduce the music they played, but for this concert, they decided to begin with music and speak afterwards. During the performance, a man sitting in the front row in his 70s, and clearly a military man with a buzz haircut and a square jaw, started weeping. When they returned to the stage for the second work, they decided to speak about the Copeland and prepare the second work. When they described the circumstances behind the writing of the violin sonata, the man in the front row burst out of the room. Although they were surprised, they were also experienced performers, and they'd seen a lot in their performing career. But after the performance, he came up to them, tears and all, and said, during World War II, I was a pilot and was in an aerial combat situation where one of the team's planes was hit. 
I watched my friend bail out and watched his parachute open. But the Japanese planes which had engaged us returned and machine gunned across the parachute cords so as to separate the parachute from the pilot. And I watched my friend drop into the ocean, realizing that he was lost. I've not thought about this for many years. And during that first piece of music you played, the memory returned to me so vividly that it was as though I was reliving it. I didn't understand why this was happening. Why now? But then, when you came out to explain that this piece of music was written to commemorate a lost pilot, it was a little more than I could handle. How did it find those feelings and those memories in me? Because of the excellence of these performers, the composer's intention became preeminent, and the players disappeared into that. Making that contact with that audience member was the greatest performance in their memory. Thank you. research on mental preparation and visualization, if you foresee more changes in the way a young musician is trained? Yeah, I would hope so. I mean, I, I find, um, well, first of all, I would say that I find this way of working so, especially for advanced players, especially helpful, and being able to separate things and the mental procedures save an enormous amount of time and take us to a deeper artistic level. But there is tremendous resistance to this from the students, I mean, uh, and from players. I mean, they love playing. <laughs> and they don't want to be denied that. You know, if you have, if you have a three-hour module to practice, people will run off with their instruments and play for three hours because they love doing it. And you sort of saying this, your work will be more effective if you would spend an hour preparing for the time that you're going to have with the instrument. Now, orchestral conductors almost have to do this if they're doing it right. In other words, they have to really conceive completely of everything that they want to have happen because they have a very limited amount of time with their instrument, which is the orchestra. Please. Were you talking about 
taught these skills in school, or, or is this something that you've developed throughout your, your whole you know, your career and teaching? And Both. Yeah, I mean, you know, when I, you know, I, when I think about where this started to happen, sometimes, you know, for example, I was doing, um, when I was in junior high school, I was delivering newspapers, the Detroit Free Press, at 4 o'clock every morning to, uh, you know, 100 and some customers I'd be pack up my saddlebags with the papers and I'd go through the route and after you've done this a while, everything's on automatic, you know, paper in between the door and the mailbox and the shoe, and it's the kind of stuff, you're just doing it. And uh, I wound up actually writing my essays and that kind of stuff on the paper route and thinking through everything I was going to do and without actually being able to write anything down, so I had to keep it sort of in my head, but I was working everything out. When I sat down, my first draft was very sort of close to what I would finally say instead of having terrible trouble with that. So they did that, then in the Concord Quartet, was, I was on the road a lot, and we were playing so much music in such uh, intense circumstances that I wound up doing a lot of practicing on the plane and working things out and preparing my part. I couldn't play it on the cello, I didn't have a choice. And uh, in the case of Sarah, for example, she didn't have a choice. She couldn't play physically that much. And so it really gave her the chance to do that. So this is something that I incorporate in my teaching now also. And, and with each generation every year, I'm learning new things about how it, how it works. Please. I wonder if you could describe for us what you are doing when you're doing a mental Okay. Um, it's, it feels, I mean, it's something that's practiced. You get into the same sort of mental condition as if you are playing. So you are, even though I'm not, Without the cello, I'm not actually moving my arms, but I am activating that part of my brain. And I'm listening, I can hear it just the way that I want to hear it. And so it's a, it's a deep level of consciousness, but I can actually walk, uh, if I'm walking on the air, and I can be mental practicing. You know, as long as I can be putting most of the focus on that kind of work. I'm afraid that's, that's all the time that we have. Thank you very much.